In this episode, I interview Keith Bevins, a partner at Bain & Company and the head of global consultant recruiting at Bain. Keith has some contrarian views on interesting things, such as how going to school right now, even if school remains online, might strategically prepare individuals to better roll with the future business environment. How Bain is currently supporting its people in times of crisis in ways that are contrary to how many other firms are supporting their people. And finally, the relevance of the case interview, unfortunately, and other key insights outside of the case interview that Bain is looking for. We hope that you enjoy this episode. We're super excited to have Keith Bevins, who is a partner at Bain with us today to share a little bit about recruiting, the current landscape and life at Bain. We want to hear all of the good personal juicy details, as well as some of the other fun stuff that you can share from the broader perspective. And overall, we're looking forward to a really dynamic conversation. So let's dive in. Sure. All right. First question, probably the most important one that I have for you is Chicago deep dish or New York style pizza. Sell us on your favorite. This is tricky because I'm going to have to uh, potentially stay in hiding and in quarantine for a lot longer, depending on my answer. I uh, I grew up in the Jersey Shore, so I'm from the tri-state. I grew up on New York style, and uh, you can move me wherever you want, but that's what I'm going for. Don't tell anybody. Can we keep this just between us? This is all that we needed to know today, and now we can move on to the really important things. Uh, otherwise, the call was going to be over, so you answered correctly. Okay, second question. A career that you could have pursued but didn't pursue. This pain thing I doesn't work out. I asked it past tense, but it, I didn't say that you can't do one of those exactly. things or all exactly. of them in the future. Okay, great. Next question. The biggest risk you've taken that's paid off? Um, 30 years ago, uh, at the age of 17, I told uh, this, this, frankly, this woman, young woman that I knew that she was the ideal woman. Uh, we had our 22nd anniversary last month. Well so done. All right. It worked out. There we go. That was a risk. Was I, I definitely, risk. definitely count that as a risk. Yep. Okay. Next question. Okay. Business leader who has inspired you? Um, my first understanding or introduction to consulting was actually a gentleman named Reggie Van Lee, who is a longtime partner at another firm. Um, he, like me, uh, is black. He was uh, one of the first black partners that I met in the industry. Uh, he also is MIT HBS like I was. Uh, so we had a lot in common. Um, and I met him when I was 17 or 18 years old and was like, that's that's the model. That's what I'd like to do. What What is consulting again? Um, and he's been a great mentor. Even, I mean, I called him for some advice a month ago. Um, so, you know, here we are literally 30 years later and he's still a mentor of mine uh, and he's been great. Amazing. Can you share one thing that he has shared with you as a piece of wisdom? Um, yeah. So one of the things that I went to talk to him about was when I was sort of in that window of deciding to take one of the other opportunities we talked about or making the push for partner. I asked him because he and I are um, a little more outspoken than most. And I sort of said, so how basically I said, how have you not gotten fired yet? Um, and he said, you know, a little bit of what I do is when I say things that I think might be controversial or might rub some people the wrong way. I usually acknowledge that before I say it and just say, you know, I realize some of you may not want to hear this or I realize it may sound like I'm not being sensitive to, but, um, and it at least took some of the edge off because people understood that, you know, he wasn't a sociopath. <laughs> he, he understood that what he was saying might rub some people the wrong way, but it needed to be said. And that that little bit of a, of a qualifier before the statements just helped. And, uh, you know, I like I said, we, we tend to be pretty much alike, although, uh, you know, although we were MIT HBS, he finished MIT in three years. It took me five. I got I got the master's degree, but at no point was I at risk of graduating early from MIT. Well done. That's amazing. OK, great. Next one. Uh, a ha outdoors happy place. My outdoors happy place. Uh, honestly, uh, as a photographer, any place with good graffiti, uh, you can see from the uh, from the background, I, I tend to 
When I travel for work, I visit parts of cities that most people skip. Anybody can see the Bean downtown or go by the Eiffel Tower, but most people don't get out into the neighborhoods and really see um, some of the culture and the art that's there. So I, I know artists all over the world and I make the effort to go um, to go snap photos uh, of different graffiti spots. I've got them all marked in Google Maps for every city around the world that I go to. Um, and I, I make a point to sort of duck out while I'm in town. There's a Google Map tag for taggers. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, no, it's mine. That one's mine. Uh, but I know where all the <laughs> spots are in the cities. Uh, and I just figured I'd celebrate Chicago a little bit with a meeting of styles background from, from Chicago. Amazing. Uh, OK, um, truth telling. This is a little bit of a diversion. But have you ever done graffiti yourself? Uh, I have not. I can't sing, dance, draw. Uh, I can get really creative in PowerPoint and take pictures. Nice. That's the extent okay. of my artistic creativity. Amazing. All right, great. Last and final, to me, the most important question, uh, other than the pizza question, which again, you answered correctly, what is your favorite donut and why? You know, it's the glazed donut. Uh, it's, it's, I'm going to out myself as a consultant. Uh, you didn't say what I do for a living, but let's assume for a second. We'll get there, but you can go ahead and reveal it now. It's a good benchmark. Like you can get a glazed donut pretty much any place that sells donuts. And if they can't do that right, there's no reason to stick around and try other stuff. That's literally the most consulting answer I've heard to that question. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, Keith, let me give you one chance to ask me one of the questions back and then we'll dive into the broader conversation. Uh, outdoor happy place. Awesome. I have so many, but one of my favorites, it's a place that I grew up. So it has a combo of nostalgia and also happiness for me is the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. And specifically, there is one hike that's there called Graveyard Fields. Um, and it has a couple of different waterfalls. You can swim in them. You can walk in the creek. So and it is, it's just something that makes me feel alive and connected when I go there on an almost annual basis. That's so I awesome. love it. That's awesome. Cool. Amazing. Okay. So what we're going to do today is talk about a couple of broad topics. We're going to talk about recruiting trends. We're going to talk about Bain right now. And also just why Bain? Why Bain for you? Why Bain for other people? Uh, but I'd like to just get a little bit of an intro from you before we do that. So can you okay. tell us a little bit of your background and your story of how you got to where you are today? Sure. And uh, are you the one sketching here on the side? No. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, Thank you to whoever is uh, providing the artistic <laughs> backdrop for this conversation. Um, so uh, I joined Bain uh, back in 1996. I did a bachelor's master's in electrical engineering. Uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in the Jersey Shore. So we, um, uh, I used to say in the middle by the water for several years. It was a little bit of a branding issue uh, for maybe a decade there. Uh, but I'm back to claiming my Jersey Shore roots. Um, I joined Bain uh, instead of taking my master's in engineering and going to Intel. I did the five-year program at MIT um, and had a really great industry offer, um, but I knew I wanted to go back to business school. And so really for me, the question was, what do I do after MIT to set myself up for business school? So I joined Bain as an AC in Chicago. Uh, I had never really been to Chicago in any meaningful way prior to that. Uh, joined in 96, uh, applied to business school uh, as a third year, like most people do at Bain, and didn't get in. Uh, I was waitlisted and then promptly rejected. Uh, I took the applications a lot more seriously the second time and got into all three schools, uh, including the one-year program at the school that had rejected me. So I would have graduated with the same class, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so I, I left and went to school. I went to Harvard Business School with my wife, um, my then wife. Uh, we had our first son while I was in business school. Uh, he's a college freshman now uh, working downstairs in our basement. And um, I rejoined Bain in 2002. So I actually um, was at Bain before at business school during and rejoined right towards the tail end of the dot-com bubble bursting. So that was my first downturn experience. Nice. Um, in 04, I was promoted to manager. In 08, I was promoted to partner. Uh, I did a bunch of different things along the way. I was the staffing manager. I led Blacks at Bain for about a decade. I was on the promotion committee for five years um, as a partner. Uh, so from 08 to 13, I was client facing in the performance improvement and healthcare practice and then um, chose to take on a different role heading up global consultant recruiting, uh, which combined a lot of the passions that I had inside Bain in a way that allowed me to do it full time. Uh, and I figured I'd do it for two years and see what happened. And here we are a little over six years later. Um, you know, business school has long since paid off, uh, which was my reason for coming. And I'm still here. Uh, so it's been a great journey. We had another son in there, by the way, in 2003. Uh, so I have a 17 year old and an 18 year old. Um, and that's that's a very short version. 
That's amazing. Well, we'll get into more of it as we go today, because I'm going to dig in to a little bit of your experience. But we do have some questions that I know that people are interested in. So I want to start with the first one. Uh, Obviously, this is April 2020. In light of COVID, has anything changed regarding what Bain looks for at the moment in experienced hires, in consultants, uh, just in general, in, in what the firm is prioritizing in terms of their talent? You know, no, the, the, what we actually look for, and it's, it, it is the title of a video I think we recorded a while back on YouTube. So if people want to know sort of what we look for, it's me talking with, uh, with uh, one of the folks on my team about it. It's the same answer. You know, not a lot has changed. I think, um, you know, the, the core skills that it takes to be successful with clients, the way you think about problems, the way you think about engaging with people, um, it may not be in person, uh, but it's still the same types of things that we're looking for. Um, and so that that part of it hasn't really changed uh you know it tends to be more important the clarity of um the clarity of where bain fits into your career journey is probably something that i think people under invest in they practice on cases they practice on remembering formulas and the seven s's like you know i'm going to quiz them on you know can they remember all of porter's five forces but at the end of the day um it's still the same types of skills the same types of things you just have to understand why and be able to articulate why coming to Bain is the right next step in your journey, because that's not obvious for everybody. So I'm going to follow that up with just a point B. How does somebody do that if they don't know, if it's if it's not immediately evident to them or if they don't have really deep experience with somebody at Bain? How do they figure that out? Yeah. So first of all, we try and put a lot out there online for that. Um, You know, I'm pretty accessible. The team is very accessible. you know, we may be doing more Zoom and WebEx and, and FaceTime calls than we have, but probably five years ago, you know, the team started the Bain Passports webinar series and the Bain Strategies webinar series. So we've been doing a lot online for a very long time. Uh, what's new is everything's online now. There's, there's, not a, there's not a webinar followed by a, and I'll see you next week when I'm in town. Um, so from that perspective, we've done a lot to try and put stuff out there. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because a YouTube video on what we look for, a YouTube video on how to create. Those are all things that's that's real. Like we're not, you know, that's not the marketing team sitting around like, what do we want to put out there in the market? It's like, no, let's actually help people. At the very least, it'll save us telling a hundred different people the same thing. Just put it out there and let everybody see it. Um, and so I do think taking advantage of the opportunities that are out there becomes really important. You know, we try and put a lot out there for that reason um, so that you can get past the level one and level two questions. You know, where are our offices, you know, what practice areas do we have? That, that stuff you can read on the website. You don't need to talk to anybody for that. Um, that is very different about your audience than I think when I came through recruiting, maybe when you came through recruiting, in the sense that, you know, in 1996, there was nothing online. You can go in the Internet Wayback Machine and look at our website back then. It, it wasn't very good. Um, and so what you knew about Bain or what you knew about any company was what they told you when they came to campus. And that was it. And now you can go on Reddit where I am, you can go on Fishbowl, you can go on Glaster, you can go on Vault, you can hop you know, on a, on a you know, management consultant forum. Like you can do a lot of different things to learn about people and learn about what the business does so that when I say, you know, why does consulting make sense for you? It's not some version of, well, I can't decide and you'll show me variety, which turns out not to be super compelling in a competitive market, right? It's a little, <laughs> who would have guessed? Um, so I think the depth of the answer in terms of what skills you'll build and, and how that fits into what career you're trying to build towards, that ultimately is, to me, very differentiating for people. And it makes me more comfortable when I'm meeting candidates and say, you know, I think I really want to come to Bain. I say, well, why? And they say, well, because the way you approach this, the way you approach that um, fits because I'm trying to do these things in my career. Ironically, uh, and then I'll shut up, it's the, it's the same types of things you talk about when you're thinking about where to go to university. You know, thinking about going to Harvard with their case method is a very different learning style than what I had with some of the other schools that I could have attended. And so, you know, being able to understand why somebody who doesn't mind debating and sharing his opinions live and in person might feel right at home in that environment. That's actually perfect for me. There are other programs where I would have sit there like bored out of my skull taking notes. That's not perfect for me. That might be great for somebody else. And that's, they're both right. Amazing. <laughs> 
Well, so that that was like a two for one answer. Okay. I, I want to follow up again on something that you said in there that I thought was really interesting. You mentioned that there are some things that people do need a second level insight, probably from a personal conversation uh, to get to. Uh, what is the appropriate way to do that, to reach out, to have a conversation that's meaningful enough that actually changes the game for them? Yeah. And there's there is a sense, I think, out there that you have to talk with people live um, and you have to sort of, you know, find your buddies. At no point during the recruiting process are we sitting around with a pile of resumes going, okay, how many people know Jenny Ray? Quick show of hands, okay, seven. Okay, how many people know Keith? Eight, Keith is in. Nobody, we're not doing that, right? And so if you really don't have anything that you need to ask, like people will wanna talk and say, you know, they'll call people on the team and say, hey, I'd, I'd love to talk to you because I wanna work at Bain. And I usually respond and say, okay, well, what specific questions do you have? I'm happy to answer them. And they go, well, I just want to sort of talk about what you all do. And I'm like, yeah, that's on the website. Right? Like, I'm not, you know. Level one. Right, right. But, um, you know, the level two questions tend to be um, things that we're also trying to proactively address because we know a lot of people have those same questions, right? Which is the Bain Passport series that we used, that we had been doing was different offices around the world hosting webinars for people interested in that office because somebody from Brussels may not be coming to Chicago Somebody from you know Amsterdam may not be going down to North Carolina to Fuqua. I just got a phone with that team uh, earlier, to my, my, my Fuqua team. They may not be making that trip, but in aggregate, there are plenty of people interested in what it's like to work in Dubai. And so what we decided was, well, why don't we just have Dubai um, get, on the, get on a call and actually talk about what we're doing in the Middle East and talk about what the office culture is like and talk about what types of work they're doing and so we're trying to actually answer those questions as well proactively by just putting that out there and, and giving people an opportunity to take advantage of those things. Um, take advantage of the on-campus resources if you're on a campus where we are recruiting. Uh, we do make a pretty big investment to, to be a part of that. Um, but I, I think technology has allowed us to connect in ways that, that probably seemed foreign 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, and that ultimately would be one of the silver linings from our current moment in time, where it just won't be weird to say, I'm not gonna fly out there to meet with you, but I'm happy to do a Zoom call. And that will be just as meaningful and just as impactful um, as being in person. Don't take that personally, that I might go to this campus and not that campus, or I came out for this group and not that group. It'll, it'll be perfectly normal and it'll be fine. And that's one of the things that I hope sort of stays with us when this is all passed. Well, I do want to talk a little bit about some Bain-specific recruiting trends that are happening right now. I know that everybody's watching at Bain to see what they're doing in light of COVID. So can you just speak a little bit about summer hiring, about what's happened with internships that were already, you know, people had already accepted or internships where people had maybe been offered but hadn't accepted? Can you talk about your plans as of right now, when what you know and when you won't expect to know about 20 20 hires starting and then also about 2021 uh, planning that's happening now. That is a heck of a compound question. I, if I could hey, summarize, okay. it was like, what's going on? I know, on? it's almost like a BCG question, right? <laughs> <I didn't laughs> okay, let that. me start Let me start at the beginning. Let's start no, with I got summer. It. I got it. Um, so let, let's talk about recruiting and what we're doing. Um, you can get me in trouble here. The, um, <laughs> the uh, look, for the summer, you know, as most people know, you know, campus hiring generally takes place in that, you know, fall of the, the prior year. So for this summer, you know, we have several hundred interns coming in around the world. A lot of the MBA interns got their offers in January. They're, they're locked and loaded. Uh, most of the undergrad interns in most markets got their offers even before the holidays. So they're locked and loaded. Um, I don't think it's a, a, a well-kept secret. It's not a secret. I sent an email to all of our interns globally uh, probably three weeks ago, letting them know we look forward to seeing you. <laughs> like we'll, we'll see you in, we'll see you this summer um, I did the same with our full-time hires that were given offers last fall and are starting um, you know throughout the summer we actually just had a group start uh, we had a start group uh, for people who graduated in December and some industry hires last week um, so from that perspective um, you know we're continuing the, to be in the market um, for fall hiring uh, you know the truth is we have our largest summer intern class ever uh, by a lot uh, this year. So just by default, a lot of our second year hiring would have been lower anyway, um, regardless of what happens now. And that's happened in the past. So people who are sort of following the cycles, uh, most people hopefully don't get left back in business school. So they're not on like year four of their MBA program. But for the most part, um, you know, second year recruiting tends to be filling in the rest of the class after you have 
you know, the ACs that return, uh, the, the summer interns that return, and then you fill in the rest of the class. So when you have a big intern class, um, you know, second year recruiting tends to be a little bit smaller. We, I expect to be on campus. My team is planning uh, right now um, uh, for that. Uh, and, and that's you know, no different uh, this year than it was in the 0809 downturn than it was in the 2001, 2002 downturn. Um, in terms of intern hiring for those uh, planning on enrolling in school in the fall, and I'll talk specifically about MBA recruiting, which is my primary focus. I recognize uh, some undergrads might be on the phone. Um, you know, the intern class that we'd be recruiting this fall would start in 2022. You know, if you look at any one of our revenue charts during the last couple of downturns, Bain always accelerates out of the downturn. Um, and so you can't accelerate out of the downturn if you actually don't have capacity to serve the work that you're that that's in demand in the market. Um, and so shockingly, right, as a strategy firm, we take a long term view on the business. Um, you know, I can't come out of the downturn without a second year consulting class because I chose to you know, turtle myself uh, in the downturn. That's not how this works. Um, you can't have a high school without a sophomore class. Like that's not a thing, right? And so I expect our intern hiring to be as robust as ever. I think the intern hiring and success we had this summer right now probably will make second year recruiting a little bit smaller, but that was gonna happen independent of the current pandemic. Um, that's, just, that's just math. Um, the good news for us is, you know, we go into this uh, current mode um, and it's COVID now and it might be a recession later, um, as strong as we've ever been. Uh, we've been through these types of downturns before. We have a tested playbook and you can look at our growth after the 0809 downturn as proof. Like we know what we're doing. We know how to navigate this. Um, you know, we think about doubling down on our clients. Uh, they are number one. Uh, and, and the clients, clients tend to remember who stuck by them when they were on this path and then all of a sudden had to take an abrupt right turn because something dramatic or something traumatic happened. Um, and so we're investing in our clients right now. We're obviously taking care of our people and we're keeping the leadership team focused on the long term prospects for the business. Um, we go into this downturn probably stronger than we ever have been um, in the past, heading into the 0809 downturn or the 0102 you know, downturn. Um, you know, we just closed the acquisition of Quartz uh, late last year. We sort of formally acquired and brought Italy into the family. Uh, we had acquired Forward. Um, you know, so we go in riding a really strong wave of momentum. So, you know, this probably will be even better than some of the other ones in terms of what it looks like on the backside. That's not um, underselling or underplaying, you know, how difficult a time this is. We're all going through the same thing, but it's affecting all of us differently. Um, and as a firm, we're making sure that we're meeting our people where they're at, um, you know, as work from home and, and things like that, so that people feel supported as they're doing their work. Um, but that's a, a lot. That's a broad answer. Um, you know, I can speak to the summer program. We are going to have the summer program. Um, you know, we're excited about, you know, some of the creative options that come into play when we're doing this. But as you'd expect, uh, you were at Bain uh, for a little while. Um, People are finding ways to stay connected that we might not have done in the past. Uh, you know, there's a couple of groups working out in, in the Chicago office alone. There's a couple of groups sort of working out together online or on Peloton. There's a couple of groups to get together to cook. There's a couple of people to get together for video gaming. And, and you know, uh, there's like a Dungeons and Dragons group. And, you know, so people are just finding ways to stay connected and just sort of hang out um, because we don't have that chance to see each other and engage the way we did. It's actually been a, a, a really... Um, refreshing view and, and reiteration of how strong our culture is and how much we actually like spending time together. Um, and this time more than ever is, is, is proof of that. I love that. Uh, can you illuminate for us what you think makes Bain different in terms of mindset and strategy than a lot of the companies that we do see freaking out in the market right now? You know, I, I, I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that we're different from companies that are freaking out or not in the sense of I think everybody is taking it seriously and that manifests itself in different ways. Right. And I think that's an important sort of thing to keep in mind that by and large, companies are trying to do the right thing by their employees and do the right thing by their customers, so on and so forth. And we're no different in that regard. I think, you know, our sense of um, responsibility to our employees and to our clients sort of drives everything that we do. Um, and so, you know, our you know, if, if you talk about sort of what makes us different in terms of how we approach that, yeah. um, I, I think that we have a mindset of we're going to we're going to win as a team. And it's not OK that I have a work from home arrangement that allows me certain things and allow, you know, I either, you know, I have two teenagers at home. They're totally fine not seeing me, but that's not everybody's situation. Right. I, you, know, you know, we're blessed in the, in the fact that nobody in our immediate family has fallen ill. 
right? And and we're not, you know, so there's a lot of things that I think, uh, like I said, we're all going through the same thing, but it's affecting us all differently. And I think because we are a very diverse place in terms of the backgrounds and the skills and the types of people that we hire, sort of our ability to roll with that and our ability to appreciate the fact that your situation may not be the same as mine, but I respect the fact that your situation means you, you can't do this, you know, your days need to end at three because you have some responsibilities that you have to take care of and I'll see you back online later or I'll talk to you tomorrow. Um, we just tend to trust each other in a way that I think manifests itself in a way that's healthy right now. Um, and, you know, I, I was talking about this with some friends that it seems like, uh, a decade ago that a toddler walked into a BBC interview and everybody thought it was the craziest thing. Uh, I'll tell you what I have, you know, we, we've had kids, pets, spouses on all of my calls almost every day now. Um, and I think what we're learning as a, as a business community is that people have whole lives and you just have to roll with it. Some things are really serious and some things aren't, um, you know, I, I'm on a call with a lot of people in a business setting and I realized I meant to change my background away from the graffiti picture. Haven't gotten to it yet, and it's fine. And and again, that's one of those things that I hope stays with us when this crisis is is sort of started to subside, um, because at the end, there's some things that matter and a lot of things that don't. And our ability to distinguish between the two actually is is this is a good chance to learn that. Well, I want to talk just about one more question related to the the macro journey that you've been on and why that what, what's coming out right now. Uh, and this is related to just Bain over the years. So you've been there for, like you mentioned, a couple of different downturns, a number of different Bain seasons, uh, pre-Zoom and post-Zoom, you know, some of the other seasons <laughs> like that. But what are your favorite surprises that you've experienced at Bain so far? And why are you specifically hopeful for the future of, of Bain? You know... The surprises tend to be, um, it, it, there, there's moments of truths that, that companies have, right? And, and there's always this sense that, um, you know, when, when the things that people remember in times of crisis or in times of turmoil or in times of celebration are, are not, they don't remember how, what happened, they remember how they felt, right? And there's sort of these moments of truth now where you see companies doing some things, unfortunately, that, that don't respect uh, the health and safety of their employees or don't ref reflect, the fact that, uh, reflect the fact that employees sort of wake up every day and decide where they're going to spend their time. Um, and some, you know, I, I think that what, what I'm seeing is not, I'm not surprised at all, um, I, but what I'm seeing is Bain's leadership team stepping up to support people in ways and, and and accommodate people in ways and sort of reassure people that things will be okay. And nobody knows how it's ultimately gonna work out, right? Nobody knows what campus will look like in the fall, right? Nobody knows if classes are gonna start up in person or be virtual in the fall. Um, but what I can say is that our operating principles in terms of how we treat each other and how we focus on our clients and those things this is just another one of those times where I've seen us make the shift to working from home and doing all of the amazing things in the background to make that possible for a firm of over 10,000 employees to literally switch to work from home overnight and watching our technology team step up to support that and our HR team make sure that people had safe places to work. Um, you know, We have, like I said, several hundred interns starting in a couple months that are, are anxious because they were supposed to go abroad for their internship uh, campus has shut down and they've been told they have to move. And where do I go? I can't go home and I can't stay here. Um, and they're reaching out to us for help. And that's one of those times where we're saying, well, let's talk about what our options are, not hang on, let me get the HR manual on this one. You know, it's, it's operating from a set of guidelines that for us, um, I'm not surprised by it one bit. I'm surprised that I even thought that was a question. You know, I, I'm surprised that I even thought there was a possibility that we wouldn't do right by, by our people. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, and I think that's been really great to see. I think another question that a lot of people are asking right now is, uh, and they're asking us, so I'm going to ask you, sure. uh, is how should I, if I do have more time, because I'm at home, not able to connect with people in the way that I normally would have, and also if I have more time, literally, like my start date is pushed back or my, um, you know, my, my internship is canceled this summer or something else, not at Bain, but obviously somewhere else, it, what should people be doing to invest in themselves if they find themselves with 
a surprise of time at the moment? What skills should they prioritize building? What kind of things should they be focusing on? It's, it's interesting because I, I, I do get that question a lot from people who are heading to school and they say, you know, I'm going to take the summer off. You know, what should I be doing before I get to school to be in a position to you know, get that internship with you or with someone else? And I say, um, live your life. Enjoy yourself. You know, you know, like don't 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 try and extrapolate from every day's accomplishments to success or being back at home at 50 in your parents' basement. Like that's not a, those aren't the only two options. And I think um, a lot of us like myself are planners, right? And we like to sort of know, okay, what am I gonna do today that's gonna get me there tomorrow? And it's like, wait, just settle down a little bit. Um, so I, I do think, um, and I was just in some training that we're doing today around personal capacity, uh, which includes sort of your physical wellness, your psychological wellness, et cetera. Um, as people just manage through the stress of this, because we, we have programs and trainings that aren't client related trainings. It's more about how you show up and how well you maintain yourself as a person. Um, that applies here as well, um, even before you get to school. And so my advice is, you know, don't freak out about it. Um, you know, I personally am working as hard as I've ever worked uh, and decided that I was going to pick up some new Photoshop skills and have set a goal of watching a bunch of online tutorials and Try to do one or two a week, um, you know, trying to just take up. Like, so it's it's weird, right? Like get a hobby. Um, but the the idea is that you don't have to sort of think about filling every moment of every day chasing the goal. You, It's OK to just relax for a minute. Um, school will be there in the fall. Um, this crisis will pass as other ones have. Um, and it's OK to be full. I yeah, have a full tank ready to go when classes do start. Um, you know, just, I, I do also, that reminds me, I, I have gotten a couple of emails um, and I wonder if people are, are asking as I'm watching the chat scroll by as well as I'm talking, but um, I have heard a lot of conversation about campuses being virtual and students not necessarily wanting to go back to business school. And we, you know, I've, I've had people reach out to me saying, you know, I think I'm gonna try and do my summer internship and then just, if school is virtual in the fall, I'll just take the second year of business school, I'll defer it for a year or two and go back. Um, which is really odd to me because I, I think what the current crisis is, has showed me, um, uh, quick anecdote, I have a friend who uh, I'm really close with. Uh, we went to business school together. We get together every year. He, he lives in Singapore. And um, he told me that when this started to ramp up over there, I'll, 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 I'll take some, some liberties with what he said, but he basically said, people went, oh, like, like SARS? Okay, let me get my mask, right? And, and then to some extent, life went on. And, and they were familiar with it and they sort of were very fluid with how they went from life as normal to lockdown to easing back. Oh, oh, wait, we went a little too far, ease back again. And I think what this is helping me understand is that the business leaders that we're going to have to have in the future are going to have to be able to navigate and, and maintain their equilibrium and their balance in an environment that's fluid like this, where it could be normal and we could get back to normal this summer. And then there might be another outbreak and your city might go on lockdown. And you need to be able to just roll with that seamlessly. And I, I think that schools are a great place to learn that. You know, if classes start virtual and then go online and then there's an outbreak on campus and they go back virtual, your ability to maintain that and keep your focus is actually going to be what you have to do to be successful in business later. I'd rather learn that at school than reading about it on the news from my parents' basement because I didn't feel like going back to school. Like, that's crazy to me. Um, I'll even go one step further and say I would question the story. This now, now is where I get in trouble. We can edit this later, right? Yeah. It's just okay. Um, <laughs> this you know, is the good stuff. <laughs> I, I think that the practical reality of thinking that you're going to quit school in between two years of business school, go and get a job in an environment where 30 million people just applied for unemployment, and you're going to find a job for somebody who's going to pay you a lot of money and wants to hire an MBA dropout so that you can work through the recession and then quit and go back to school when the economy turns around, that's just not smart strategy. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that doesn't make any sense at all. The best place to be in a recession, coming from somebody who watched his peers in 0102, yeah, that's school, go to school. And, and I think what's different is you will also learn, like I said, how to navigate this type of environment. You know, how does social distancing work in a place where people do need to interact. And I think that's valuable experience. I think you can take that as a learning experience and it'll be a unique experience. And to some extent, the people that go through that on campus this fall um, will be some of the people who are most familiar with what that looks like, more so than people like myself who, you know, who haven't been in that environment, who work from home when they're not traveling. So I, I think there's opportunity here. And I, I would hate for people to, 
don't hate anything. I would not like for people to miss it um, as they go through their journey. I love that perspective. It's one that I haven't heard before. And it's very different from mine, which is that I I recommended uh, what I did was sail across the Atlantic Ocean on a boat. It's like self-quarantining for two months. And I think it's a less helpful suggestion than yours. So thank you for your (laughs) insight. (laughs) It'd be a great experience as well. <laughs> it, it was a one time in, in the in a life experience, not necessarily what I'd want to repeat, but quarantine friendly at the moment for sure. Yes, for sure. <laughs> So um, one of the other questions I think that people have been asking is, uh, and we kind of talked to this about trying to dig into what that level two question insight looks like for um, for Bain. But what do you think, you know, what is your why Bain? What, how, what distinguishes Bainese from other people? You've had the choice of looking at other roles and other places to work. Um, and and I'm, I know that a lot of people do effusively talk about the people at Bain, but what is your why Bain? Yeah, so there's a couple of different things that come to mind. So, you know, for me, my initial reaction in joining Bain, um, you know, and I, I'm really candid about this. When I applied to Bain, um, you know, I didn't apply. Most people apply to all three BBM firms as they go. Uh, most people do that acronym backwards. I'm not sure why, but um, and <laughs> you're you're a contrarian. You look at graffiti and you say BBM instead yeah. of MBB. Uh, but I, I think, um, you know, for me, the people that I met at the firms did feel different. Um, and the more I got to meet people, the more I felt like um, there were certain places where I felt like my personality and the things that I liked and the, the level of acceptance that I felt um, were a good fit. And so I didn't apply to all three. And I actually withdrew from the other one first round interviews when I got the Bain offer. Um, so it is very different. And I think when you invest the time to really get to know, you, you, you kind of know, you feel like where you belong. And that, that was my experience. That's unique, and I realize not everybody will get to that place, um, especially in our current environment. You apply to all three, and you want all three. I, I didn't have to do that. Um, frankly, I probably just didn't know any better at 22 or 23 or whatever it was. Um, but you know, from a why Bain perspective, I really think that for me, getting to see a bunch of different things early with the idea that I would specialize over time was helpful. So if I think about if I were a consultant coming in post business school or from industry or PhD program, I do think that the ability to see a lot of different things matters a lot. You know, I um, as a partner, I spent a lot of time working in operations for a, a healthcare provider that ran close to 2000 clinics around the country. And with the ACA, people remember when that was coming through, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, but one thing that wasn't, you know, was not in question was they were going to have to get a lot more efficient about how they ran their operations. And so it almost became this thing where it was like, okay, how can we keep our exam rooms full? Like we cannot just have them empty for hours at a time. We need to keep them turning. Earlier in my career, right out of Harvard, I am at a business school. I came back and worked in the restaurant sector and we were looking at some of the, some of the um, operations for a restaurant client. And it, I, I've told the story on campus, but it turned out that when I started looking at healthcare, you know, all these healthcare executives and veterans were sort of going, we have to figure out how to get the throughput on our exam rooms up. And I was like, oh, that's I know it's new to you all, but, you know, they've been doing that in the restaurant industry for for like a century now. Um, and the idea of like taking the insights from the restaurant work that I did to my healthcare client was like hugely valuable. And you think about the steps, right? You sort of go, you check in, you go to the bar, you sit in the waiting room, you, you know, they take your vitals, you order your appetizer. You eat your meal, you see your doctor, you pay, you check out, you set up a new, <laughs> the steps are exactly the same. You know, and so what was a really unique and innovative business problem in healthcare was like old news in the other restaurant, in the other sector. And Bain's model doesn't make you specialize when you join. It, it expects you to see a lot of different things, not because we don't think you need to ex, you know, have expertise and specialize over time, but because there's a baseline understanding of experiences that you wanna be able to draw from in your career so that you can actually bring those breakthrough insights. I mean, frankly, if every if healthcare expertise was all that was needed to crack all the healthcare problems in the world, the experts would have solved it and we wouldn't need to have a healthcare practice. That's not how it works, right? And so for me, that ability to see a lot of different things was very helpful on the front end. Um, you know, I think now our approach to digital is, is going to prove right, which is it has to stay very tightly integrated with the core business. You can't sort of have a retail practice in a group that does digital over here. Like if you're not in digital and retail, especially now, people are realizing, like, what are you doing? Like if all the digital retail works over there, what's the retail practice doing? Right? Like, (laughs) How does that work exactly? Um, And so um, um, it's it's a small it's a much larger conversation. But I think there's things like that that are are particularly unique to Bain Um, when you join Bain and Company. And just two other quick things, you know, when you join Bain and Company, you join an office. 
Um, I think you were in Atlanta. I was in Chicago. My business card said Bain. My offer letter actually came from the Chicago office. Right. And so I became part of a community of people that I got to know really well. And I know our introduction was through somebody you knew from when you were back back in the day. Exactly. Uh, you know, and I still keep in touch with a lot of alumni as well. Um, you know, and it's just one of those things where you start building that tight community. And that just felt that felt right for me. And then the people I've um, I, I did track in college and I did field events and I was basically a specialist at the end of my college track career. And anybody who's done track knows meets run all day. But when you're only competing for an hour, you're hanging out a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of hanging out if you're doing one event over the course of 10 hours. And yes. um, the people at Bain, for whatever reason, felt like the people that I really enjoyed spending time with on my team. And that's more of a gut feel. And that's why we try and put ourselves out there so much so that you can get to know us a little bit better. And I, I'm very careful to say that the cultures across the three firms that most people are considering when they have options, they're different. They're not better or worse. They're just different. Your job is to actually understand what those differences are and figure out which one makes, you know, which differences make it better or worse for you. Because what's better or worse for Keith might not work for, for Jenny Ray. And that's totally fine. It's not better or worse. They're just different. Um, and for me, Bain was a great fit. I, like I said, I joined because I wanted to go to business school. Uh, I became a free agent effectively 2003. And 17 years later, I'm still here because it's been the, it's been the right choice for me. I think just to to get personal for me for a second, Bain was a place that taught me that you don't have to leave somewhere because you're unhappy. I had never had that experience before. And it was one of the first places that I ever left because I felt like there was a bigger dream out there. And when I came into Bain, I did not feel like there could be a bigger dream than Bain. Uh, and and it's such an exciting place to be in a place where, um, where the, those pathways can be parallel yeah. and uh, people can just get excited about wherever they end up going, where it doesn't feel like you have to leave a job because you don't like and, it and but there's all, just you stay part of the things. family you know I, I tend to think there's um what do you get paid to do who do you get paid to do it with and how much do you get paid to do it and what's been interesting for me on my journey is that at different stages of my life different questions were more important than others and so it's not that i i, I was we were just talking about this on on reddit of all places uh earlier this week but you know it's not that i've stayed for 23 years or 24 years it's that i stayed two years 12 times <laughs> <laughs> right. And that you, you sort of keep, you know, you think about what else is out there, because if I'm going to work this hard, I have to be able to look my wife in the eye and say, no, this is really the best place. And you only know that if you actually know what other places are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I, you look, but every time I've looked, I've said, no, Bain is actually the best place. Um, and it, by far, it's not really a question uh, for me and where we're at in our life. And different things change. You know, early on in my career, my wife was doing her graduate degree at Stanford. I was like, I'll do whatever. Just just pay me. Like, I, I, you know, I've been in school for five years. Let's get on with this. And now we're in a different place in our lives where it's more like, well, who am I working with and what types of problems am I solving that's more important than the money? And that's, you know, it's not to say that one set of questions is more important than the other, but at different chapters in my life, I just I cared about different things and they were all right at that time. They're not right now. So good. Well, I have a, a couple of questions from our audience that I've selected that I think will keep the conversation spicy. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> Not in a bad way. Good spicy. Um, so the first one is, can you talk about the most important skill that you learned or that was imparted, mentored to you um, in your first few years at Bain that launched you into the partner plus role that you've been in more recently. Wow, you hear me really that's your that's your opening question. Um Is, do, you, <laughs> do you want do you want a hard one? I can give you a hard one. No, this one gave me trouble. Um, you know, look, I'm just kidding. I, I um like a lot of people um that are that are coming into Bain and into professional services and highly competitive fields um from great schools and great programs. Um I think um I think I came in with a lot of confidence um, and not, well, people will have different degrees of that, but I think learning to trust um, the, the intentions and the, the rigor that other people were putting into their work. And I'm talking about, I mean, for me, when I joined Bain, I was an associate consultant. So, you know, we're not talking about consultant Keith or industry hire manager Keith. We're talking about like right out of college, didn't take any business classes in college Keith. And, and I tended to think that if you didn't explain to me your rationale and I didn't agree with it, you didn't know what you were talking about. And, 
yeah, there's just a lot of smart people here. <laughs> like, that's just not that's just not how it works. Um, and so understanding that I may not understand your intentions, but I need to actually truly trust, which ironically is one of our operating principles. I need to truly trust that you have a rationale for why you did it that way. And I need to really trust that you did it the way it needed to get done. And you may not have time, um, you know, Mrs. Manager, Mr. Manager, to explain to me why I need to do it this way. But I need to trust that there's a reason and, and wait my turn. Um, I bring that one up. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of a recency bias, but I was I had a presentation that I did internally um, pulling out quotes from my reviews uh, as an AC. And one of the direct <laughs> quotes, one of the direct quotes from my ACs was Keith needs a, to, to focus a little bit more on output than justification. <laughs> right. And I was like, huh. Yeah, that's. That's good. Uh, and it's and it's true. And now that I'm on the other side of that, I'm like, look, I'm busy. I just need you to do this. I'll explain it later. I, I do follow up and do that. But I, I don't think that that's where I was earlier in my career. And I would do things sort of, you know, a little bit pouty about things. I was like, no, just get over yourself. This person's been doing this job for a long time. Play your position. Um, you know, and that's and that that advice and sort of basically chilling the hell out actually helped me a lot. <laughs> All right. So here's another one. Speaking of speaking of chilling the hell out and trying to figure out what we're all doing now, um, let's assume that some positions are going to be fully virtual this summer and we don't really know exactly what it's going to look like. But what does that look like? How do you do that well? What is what is your thought uh, and advice on that at the moment? You know, so we're thinking about a lot. And let, let, so let me let me just really clarify here. I think that the nuance here is we have a, there's a difference between extending relationships that you already had to the virtual environment and beginning new ones. Yeah, so like new people, like you're you're getting staff to a team that you may not know. Um, yeah. So first of all, I I don't think we have the answer, right? I don't think we. Not, this is new for all of us. You know, and, and yes, like FaceTime has been around for a long time. And some of us have been online since the late 80s, which I have, you know, like it's but but this this whole thing is new. And, and I think there has to be an understanding that we're going to make some mistakes. We're going to do some things a little weird. Um, you know, I'm going to be on mute for the first few minutes of a management consultant call. You know, like like there's just things where it's like, oh, OK, I, I didn't know that was a thing. I'll, I'll be on it. You know, like so. I do think that there's, a, first of all, a baseline set of expectations where you just have to understand, like, it's not going to be as perfect and as smooth. And, you know, we're 47 years old as a firm, 40, 48 years old as a firm, uh, 47. You know, our summer associate program is a well-oiled machine. And this year, we're going to be onboarding a lot of people, you know, well over 300 people virtually. That's new. We've never had to do that before. And so I, I think there's a little bit of just an acknowledgement of, like, everybody's going to try their best. Again, Trust my intentions. I'm going to trust yours and we'll, we'll work from there. I think what we're going to do is, um, you know, it's, it's not a matter. And this is the companies that figure this out well early are going to are going to succeed at the end of the day. It's not taking what you do and putting it on Zoom. You know, it's different when we're in training and you went through this like I did when you're in training, you know, for eight hours a day. But you're in the room and you can take a break and you can get up and go to the bathroom and you, you know, there's going to take a one hour break and then we're going to go to dinner together. Yeah. I could do eight hours of Zoom. And you know what? People would be like ready to jump off the bridge. Like people would be miserable. Like people will, will not like that. And so on the other hand, I think virtual allows you to open up opportunities that you may not have opened up otherwise. Because, you know, at the end of at the end of the summer, we do our presentations. Not that has not changed. Um, and usually it's the team from the office with a couple of other LT members that want to join. Well, now I might be able to have somebody from the practice area leadership team join. I would never have flown them out for a, a, a 45 minute summer associate presentation, but if all they have to do is hop on the Zoom call, like, sure. So, you know, things like that. I also think, um, and where we're, at, you know, kidding aside, like we'll, we'll do the work. You know, our clients are doing it. People will figure it out. Frankly, a lot of your audiences, they're going to engage with us virtually after just having done it for two months at school. So you know, who's teaching who? Right. I think where we're going to be different than a lot of places is we're going to focus a lot more on some of the non work, non training aspects of the experience. And, and we're thinking about how do you translate some of the culture that you talked about and that you've experienced and that, frankly, keeps me here in, in most cases. Right. How do I translate that to an environment where it's fully virtual? You know, how do I do? Do we just you know, I was I emailed our office services guys the other day when I'm in the office, um, I ride in with my family. Um, well, my, my younger son and my wife drops me at the train on the way to school. So I get in like crazy early and I'm not a morning person. 
So I'm in at like 7.45. I'm like, why am I here right now at 7.45? But I see the office services team setting up the office, um, you know, and getting it ready for the day while I'm getting my coffee and, and eating my glazed donut, actually. Um, and so um, I emailed one of them last week and was like, hey, dude, like, maybe like once or twice a week or once every two weeks, can we just set up like a morning coffee so like I could see you guys and say hi? Cause that was like part of my routine. You know, like that was, and, and, and that's just, we don't need an agenda. We don't need slides. We don't need something formal, but just making sure that we can have that connectivity. And every office at Bain right now is doing some really cool stuff to just maintain that culture and keep people connected to each other. I, I mentioned some of it earlier, but I, I think how we do that during the summer is gonna be even more intentional because people aren't gonna have the in-person relationship to rely on the way I do with you know my office, the office services team, um, and so I, I I won't give anything away on this call, but we're we're planning for some really great stuff. I'm I'm actually excited about you know how the team is thinking about it and the the breadth of of things that they're thinking about. It's not just lifting and shifting and just converting everything to Zoom. That's going to be boring as hell. One of the things that you mentioned, I just want to confirm. You want to go on the record to say this: you don't have to bring slides to a meeting. Is that is that really true? Um, so there's a fine, I always, I joke around with some people because you know, they say things and I say, well, look, there's a line between reality and fiction. And that line is the slide. Once it's on a slide, it's real. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, you know, I, I think as a, as a firm, and maybe that's changed a little bit since you were here, it's changed a little bit over the years too. You know, it's not all about the PowerPoint. It's about the conversation. It's about driving the action. PowerPoint should actually support you know, the points that you're trying to make. It's not about the slides. The slides are there to help, right? The slides are there to illustrate the point. Um, and so, you know, in this environment, yeah, it's not about the slides. It's about, are we having the right conversation on the right issues? Again, as a, as a photographer, I tend to be a little more visual. So I need to actually see things to react. If you just talk to me, I'll just, I just, I don't process it the same way, but I know that about me. Um, but it, it's, like I said, it's gonna be an interesting time for us to use technology in ways that, and stretch us in different ways. But what I think is, is um, and maybe it's too soon to talk about silver linings, but I think it will teach us that we can actually do this and be okay, <laughs> right? We can actually engage by, you know, and, and a lot of your audience knows, you know, people will fly for one hour meetings, you know, go to, I'm going to Asia because we have to do this, two minute thing. And, and, and I think what we're going to learn here is we just don't need to do that as much as we thought. And actually, we might be able to engage in different ways that are more beneficial and more impactful because, you know, I could put that flight time back into spending an extra half hour talking to somebody that I may not have had time for otherwise. And that I think at the end of the day, I'm hoping that some of those lessons stick um, and we don't look at this as sort of the lost half a year. We actually look at it as a time where we were forced to do some things. Um, I, I used, uh, it's not a, a great metaphor, but why not? Um, you know, with my team this morning, I said, look, you know, you can either eat right and start exercising before or after you have the bypass, but if you can do it before you have to have the bypass, you probably like your life experience a lot better. And this is forcing us to do some things that I could argue we probably should have been doing for years. And I mean us in industry, us corporate America. Um, and, and so it is a good forcing function for us to do some things that frankly, the technology has been ready for and our legacy and our inertia have prevented us from doing it. Now we have no choice. I don't remember can the I last time a... I went two months without getting on a plane. <laughs> but we can do it. It's possible. I don't know. I, American, emailed, American emailed me this morning and I was like, I miss you guys. <laughs> I got that email too. <laughs> yeah. What okay, else? so so I want to take one quick left turn and then we'll come back and land it. Sure. So left turn is around data and skills. And this is kind of yeah. a combo question from Angela, Sean, Roger, um, and uh, Dan. So this question is related to like, do you do you just need to know Excel or do you actually to to get in the door at Bain, do you need to know R? Do you need to know SQL? Do you need to know Python? Do you need to know I feel like somebody, somebody is asking because they saw me spark uh the ire of the Reddit community uh, when I pointed out <laughs> that in 2020, Microsoft Outlook and Excel and Word are not resume worthy skills. <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't know, in second grade, my sons were using Google Docs. Like, why are you in business school with Word on your resume? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, seriously, I'm going to assume you know how to use a Word processor. You did type this telling. letter, right? Um, you know, it's not like they wrote a handwritten cover letter. Um, I think that there's a couple of things that I would say, you know, no, we're, you know, I don't expect people coming out of business school or undergraduate business programs or even engineering to, you know, be Python programmers, um, so on and so forth. I do think that there's a baseline level of skills that people should have. 
familiarity with Excel, some people will be more or less familiar with it. That's okay. Right? We have training for that. I think the learning curve is going to be different for people that come in with those skills versus not. You know, as a, as a master's in engineering from MIT, yeah, I was pretty comfortable in Excel and, and building models. I didn't know how to read a balance sheet. <laughs> you know, so like, let's, you know. Who, so what who, did you model? Yeah, what like, you model? <laughs> like, yeah, you tell me what to put in, I'll build the model. Right. So <laughs> I, I do think there's a, there's, there, you, people should keep in mind that we understand that people come in with different skills and that's okay. Right. I think when it comes to those more advanced tools like Alteryx and Tableau, um, I think that you're going to have to understand at a baseline when those tools would be helpful. Right. Like I don't uh, uh, coming out of my MBA program, I wouldn't say that I was a finance expert, but I knew what questions to ask my CFO clients. Right. Like I knew enough to know when that would be helpful. Right. Like when when and that's. For, for Alteryx, for Tableau, for Python, for R, you need to understand when that is the right tool for the job, right? And you need to understand when that would be necessary. Now, you might have to learn it, and that's okay. But I, I think that those are some of the skills, like you asked about skills, I, I um, <laughs> uh, out with, no nerd jokes coming up in the, in the chat, but um, two weekends ago, uh, I had a Friday, we were supposed to go on college visits with my son. Um, and so Friday and Monday, I, I had basically no meetings. Between Friday afternoon after lunch and Sunday morning, I spent 20 hours learning Alteryx and Tableau with a made up um, exercise that I did using the downloaded Peloton data that I had because I wanted to learn how to cut the data and I wanted just some rough familiarity of what it could and couldn't do. I know Access really well. I know Excel really well. I didn't know those tools. Am I an expert at it? No, but do I have some basic familiarity so I know when somebody says, should I build this in PowerPoint? I'm like, no, use Tableau. We're talking about data visualization. PowerPoint is not the right tool. That's gonna be a pain in the neck for everybody. Could I do it? Probably not, but do I know that you can? Yeah, I do. And so I think that intellectual curiosity, which is one of the things that we look for uh, at Bain, you know, that manifests itself for people that have been here 24 years and people that are just starting out, right? And I, I, I think that people have to understand when those tools are helpful and be prepared to learn them if they need to. Just like they would need to learn an industry if they got staffed to that industry or learn, you know, some other analytic technique if that's what the case called for. That's just part of that. It's, uh, as I'll say, an occupational hazard. Awesome. OK, the final question yes. um, is, is there any chance that in our transformation to a new world that the case interview will become less relevant going forward? I don't know if that's partly a hopeful question or, <laughs> or a serious it. question, but I am interested in your answer. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. Um, you know, the case interview, um, again, I, I will like it, put it back to when you and I were coming through recruiting, which might have been different times, but still this, the, the, the analogy will hold. Um, you know, we didn't have as much access to students and they didn't have as much access to us. Right. And so I think students, when they, by the time I get to campus in the fall, whether it's by Zoom or in person, students will know a heck of a lot more about Bain in September, October than they did a decade ago. And that's OK. Um, the case interview in context is one of several data points that we're using. Um, you know, it's rare that we're interviewing people uh, in cases and we haven't met them outside of the cases, whether it's in a case workshop or in you know, some on campus events and things like that. So I think that comes from a place of assuming the case interview is the end all be all. And, and it hasn't been. Uh, it's a little see again. It's just us on here. Right. I can only see you. It's just us. Yeah, it's actually it's actually not the big deal um, that people make of it because of the other things that I talked about. Right. And I, I spoke to somebody the other day uh, who emailed me and was like, you know, what do I need to do to get to Bain? You know, I've done 80 practice cases. And I was like, well, one, stop doing practice cases because that's way too many. Right. Like because those are the people who come into the case interview. And no matter what you ask them, just like when you're studying for a quiz and you're trying to get all the formulas on paper before you forget them, uh, you know, because you were cramming in the hallway. Um, you know, you say uh, so this company is uh, looking at cutting costs and you um, you know, they want you to look at the manufacturing efficiency in their plant and you're like, OK, revenue minus cost equals profit. I'm like, what is <laughs> what are we talking about here? Right. And I think that's when people over prep. So the case interview is important, but it's important because of a couple things. And I, I have no problem saying this it's, again. This is on the website. We yep. look for problem solving ability. Can you frame it? Can you execute the analysis? Can you draw out the insights and drive the conversation? And then can you communicate effectively? And do I think you can take coaching and feedback to be a productive member of the team? That's what I'm looking for in the case interview. OK, and that is, I would say, necessary, but not sufficient. 
because there's so many other things that come into play. So the case interview is important, but I think students tend to think that it is the end all be all. And that's that's not the case. Um, and I think keeping it in perspective and understanding, again, why Bain is the right fit, why consulting is the right fit actually turns out to be just as important. Um, having gone through the college application process with my other son two years ago, um, case interviewing is no different than like applying to college. Like, yeah, there's a lot of 4.0 students out there with great SAT scores. <laughs> like you're not special in that sense, right? And you're not special if you can absolutely crush the cases. But when, when I stop and say, so how's your week going? And you're like, uh, I don't know. I didn't prepare for that question. You're like, well, okay, well, that's going to be a problem because a client might ask you how your weekend was. <laughs> like, like, and you have to be okay with it. Um, so I, I, I don't think the case interview... Um, is the end all be all. It is very important. It's important to prepare. You know, if you got to campus in September and you were interviewing in January and you did one case a week through the fall, you're probably going to be fine. As long as you're doing the other things to learn about the journey that you're on. Um, and that's something that I can say here. People can listen to it. You can shout it from the rooftops and 90% of people won't believe us. Absolutely. I have pretty good insight into our recruiting process. I mean what I say. <laughs> Well, on that note, we just want to thank you so much for your time. No, it's been really, really exciting. There are so many unanswered questions from the call. So it seems like we're going to have to start about 50 Reddit channels or themes <laughs> or, or conversations in order for, for you to get the chance to answer those. But but once yes. again, thank you no, so thank much you. for your time. And we've really appreciated hearing from you. No, thank you. And if you want to uh, get me those questions, um, maybe we can consolidate them and I can upload you know some text responses or even record a video response for your audience, if that helps. We'll Fantastic. See. That would okay. be amazing. Thank you, Keith. What, what I'll do now is I'm going to pop up on the screen just a way that everybody can get in touch with us. Uh, Keith, uh, Keith has said that he is responsive, but probably not to all 2000 people. There are questions like you heard that are appropriate to do on your own and then others that might be appropriate to reach out to um, Keith, his parallels, people that are inside the firms that you know, not just Keith. Uh, Keith is powerful, but not all powerful, right, Keith? <laughs> <laughs> <Too kind. laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, and so we'll pop that up here. And for anybody who does have additional questions, we will, um, we'll save the chat and then we'll go through that and Keith will send it over yeah, to your team. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get something out, of course. Wonderful. We appreciate you. Thank you all. And uh, Naman and I will stick on the call for a little bit longer. Well, Keith will release you. We appreciate okay. you. Thanks again. Have okay, a great rest you of your day. Me. Thanks for all your help. And thanks for the questions, everybody. Uh, it was great talking with you. Bye-bye.